in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name.
Lord, have your way in this place right now. So, old Joe was dying. Before he died, he wanted to make amends with those he had wronged and who had wronged him. So he called up Bill, who was his former best friend. Old Joe's on the phone with Bill and he says, you know what, Bill, I'm dying. And I want to make amends. Would you please come visit me? Bill says, yeah, sure, why not? Bill goes to visit Joe and you know, Joe just comes right out with it. You know what, Bill? I want to just say, I'm sorry. I have wronged you, and I pray you'll find it in your heart to forgive me. Not only that, but I forgive you, Bill, for everything that you did to me. Bill says, okay. As Bill turns to leave, Joe calls out to him, wait a second, Bill, I just want to say one thing. Just remember, if I get better, this doesn't count. Maybe they'll get it later, I don't know. <laughs> and so, our text this morning is one verse, Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. On our worst day, Jesus was praying for us. He was praying that, praying something that he had always preached, love thine enemies. As time ran out, as negotiations failed in the last communication between the holy parent and hostage child, Jesus, the talk was of forgiving enemies, of pardon for persecutors. This prayer was sent to break a seemingly unending cycle of domestic violence, which began with Cain and Abel. The hostage Jesus was condemned by children of the parent to whom he was praying to. At bottom, this prayer is a family affair, a child talking to his parent about the sisters and brothers who are breaking his heart and taking his life. It's no wonder we call this the passion narrative. But you know what? Despite the line about not knowing, this prayer is not a defense of those brothers and sisters' actions. Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. It is true they acted in ignorance, but ignorance is not innocence. Recently, a review of documents revealed that a Nazi official in France during World War II had secretly protected Jewish refugees. A Nazi protecting Jewish refugees. He did not live to accept the credit for this, though, because Jewish members of the French resistance gunned him down just before the war ended. If only they had know, known what he had done for their people. But unfortunately, they did not know really who they were killing. Neither do we. I titled this sermon, The More You Know. Because the more we know what Jesus did for us, the more we know about God's love for us, the more we are set free. With forgiveness comes knowledge and freedom. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. To fully understand this prayer, we have to look at the context in which these verses were spoken. Am I right? Father, forgive them for they. Who are the them and they in this verse? Maybe it's just the people that I'm going to mention in a few minutes in this gospel. Or maybe it's us in this room. 
We're going to look at the evidence and find out. Jesus' earthly mission is coming to its completion. For three years, Jesus had been healing. For three years, Jesus had been teaching. For three years, Jesus had been reviving. For three years, Jesus had been forgiving. For three years, Jesus had been mentoring 12 disciples. But now at the end of that three years, by this point, the Jewish council, which consisted of the high priest, the elders, and the teachers of the law, they are completely fed up with Jesus. These are Jesus' biggest haters. Why? Number one, Jesus had challenged their authority. Two, he had broken their laws about Sabbath observance. Notice how I said their laws, not God's laws. Number three, he mixed with people the Jewish leaders viewed as unclean. And four, he made claims about himself that the Jewish leaders just could not accept. So, guided by pride and jealousy and spiritual blindness, they flipped one of the 12 disciples named Judas, they got to him. They turned him into an undercover agent. All it took to, to get him to sell Jesus out was 30 pieces of silver. The plan being to kidnap Jesus and make him stand trial. Well, the plan worked because Judas led them to where Jesus was at a time when he was most vulnerable in the dark, late at night, during the Passover celebration, while most people were in their beds sleeping, the less witnesses, the better, right? Jesus gets arrested, accused of being disrespectful to God. The Son of God accused of disrespecting they had a word for this. They called it blasphemy. Blasphemy by him claiming to be the Messiah, claiming to be God's son. They said he is speaking blasphemy. They couldn't find anything to charge him with, so they tried to charge him really quickly. They listened to false testimony after false witness until finally asking Jesus the question, are you the Messiah, son of God? And Jesus, after sitting there, listening to all the lies and misquotes of his words being reported in the shady methods, which we're going to get to, those shady methods that the Jewish high council understood, he understood what it was. No matter what he said, they wanted him to be guilty that night. And so he responded, so you say. That was enough to get them to cry blasphemy. Guilty is the verdict. Now, the interesting th thing is here, I mentioned there was some shady things going on, right? The Jewish council actually had rules in place regarding their own trials. A trial could not take place at night. This is their rules. They said a, child could, a trial could not take place at night. But when did they kidnap Jesus? Their rule, they said, a trial could not take pl place during an important festival. This is during Passover. Another one of their rules, the death could not be passed immediately after ruling a guilty verdict. But when did they declare him to suffer capital punishment? That night. Normally they would have to wait overnight and pass it the next day. But they hurried this trial along and sentenced him that night. Another rule, anyone giving false evidence was sentenced to the same punishment as the person on trial. Everybody in there that gave a testimony was not telling the truth, yet none of them received the same punishment as Jesus. It's funny, they were accusing Jesus of falling short of their standards Meanwhile, they're not even holding themselves to their own standard. 
Now, blasphemy was taken very seriously and it was punishable by death. However, the Jewish council was still under Roman rule and didn't have the power to carry out the execution themselves. They can only sentence it. Are you still with me? As a result, Jesus now must stand trial in Rome. <laughs> Jesus is then chained and brought before the Roman governor, Pilate. Now the Jewish council was slick. Check this out. The original charge against Jesus was blasphemy, right? Because he had said or claimed to be the Messiah, the Son of God. They understood if we go to Rome and we tell the Roman governor, Pilate, that this is why we want him punished, he's going to want nothing to do with that because that's a religious matter. So they're slick. They said, claim, they changed the charge to him saying he's the Son of God to saying he said he's the King of the Jews. A subtle difference because by him claiming to be the king of the Jews, a king, well, Rome already had a king. So by them telling them that, it was like him declaring the throne was going to be his. He was now considered a threat to Rome. Mm. Talk about shady politics. I'm reading this, I'm like, I don't need to watch an episode of Scandal. This is, this has enough right here, shady politics right here. But Pilate is in a difficult situation here. The Jewish council and the mob of witnesses are seeking capital punishment for Jesus. But Pilate doesn't want to shed innocent blood. There wasn't substantial evidence. It was just the Jewish uh, leader's word against Jesus' word. I'm sure Pilate was stressed out during this time. Should I do the right thing? Should I listen to the crowd right now? His wife actually had a dream that Jesus was innocent. Pilate even tried to avoid it by taking advantage of a Passover custom that allowed the release of a prisoner, one prisoner of the people's choice. So he presented the people with Jesus and another prisoner who was doing time for murder, thinking that there's no way they, they would vote for the release of a murderer over this innocent man. So he's like, okay, I can get out of this now. What will you people have me do? Release Jesus, this innocent man, or release this person convicted for murder? Name was Barabbas. They shouted, release Barabbas. Crucify Jesus. Pilate gave in when the crowd said, if he lets Jesus go free, they will tell the, the actual king of Rome at that time, the Caesar, that Pilate let him go, let go of the man who challenged the throne. He would then right away be seen as an enemy in the Caesar's eyes. And at the, he already had a rocky relationship. He was trying to gain the trust of the king because he had lost it. Nah, man, Pilate liked that position too much. He enjoyed that status too much. His reputation was on the line with this decision. And there was no way he was going to allow himself to be on the wrong side of history. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They don't. Well, after Pilate gives the guilty verdict, he hands Jesus over to the Roman soldiers to do a type of torturing called flogging. During this course, Jesus was leaned over a stone column a little bit smaller than this podium Hands chained, unable to move. Then two or three Roman soldiers, the size of wrestlers, would come out to do the torturing. 
Jesus didn't just have a few whip marks on his back. His body was literally ripped to shreds. And then, as if the beating, lying, flogging wasn't enough, they mocked him. They put a crown of thorns on his head, a scarlet robe around him and a stick in his hand and knelt down mockingly saying, long live the king of the Jews. They humiliated him more, some more, until finally they led him out to be crucified. After all the beating, laughing and mocking, in that moment on the cross, Jesus lifted his head to offer a prayer. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Let's take a quick look now at the them and the they that Jesus referred to in his prayer. I just gave you the backstory. So did they really not know what they were doing? Judas didn't know what he was doing when he sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver? The Roman soldiers didn't know what they were doing when they were just following orders? Did the people really not know what they were doing when they mocked Jesus and voted for his crucifixion? Did Pilate really not know what he was doing when he sentenced Jesus to death? Did, did the Jewish council really not know what they were doing when they broke their own rules to kidnap him? You're telling me they didn't know what they were doing, Jesus? Every wrong we do has a price. But if the almighty God can cancel the debt of the people that killed his son, Jesus, surely there must be hope for you and me. God no longer holds us responsible to pay that debt because Jesus paid for it on the cross. Let's look at Psalms 103, verses 8 through 12. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Let's look at Micah chapter 7, verses 18 and 19. It reads, Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of, of his inheritance. You do not stay angry forever, but delight, delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. One more verse, Jeremiah 31 verse 34. It says, I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. These verses are the true essence of what it means to forgive. This means that you and I, if we accept this forgiveness that the Lord is offering, we too can be free. Free to live for him, free to have a relationship with him. Jesus isn't just offering forgiveness, though. He's offering us something even greater than that. He doesn't just want to free us from the punishment that we deserve. He's looking for reconciliation, a chance to have a relationship with the Father. So why do we think we have the privilege to hold people that have done us wrong hostage to what they did to us in the past. When I was writing this sermon, I actually started the process a little over a month ago. I was doing my research. I was like, yes, you know, 
I'm way ahead of the ball. You know, I don't have to preach until a month from now. I'm going to be going to be so ready on that day. Praying to God, asking him to give me revelation about this text, to show me what the text means. Because you know it's God's word. Only God can interpret his word. I can't interpret God's word. Week after week goes by, and I had not even started writing this sermon. I feel like I'm doing everything I can do, but it's just not coming. Fast forward to last weekend, a week before today, I still don't have a sermon written. I'm like, okay. Pressure's building. I'm like, God, all right. (laughs) I know you. You are an on-time God. (laughs) This is looking like, I think this is it, right? (laughs) I realized, you know, something was blocking what I needed to receive from God. And I realized what that was. I can't preach about forgiveness while withholding forgiveness from others. And so, you know, if I can be real for a moment, for a little over 10 years, I had been holding in anger and resentment toward my parents. You know, I wouldn't, you know, when we spoke, I'd, I'd be, you know, cordial. Hey, how you doing? I'm not a rude guy, so I'm, you know, I'm not going to be mean toward them. But in my heart, in my heart, I had not forgiven them. Forgiveness happens on the inside. It doesn't matter how I treated them on the outside. In my heart, I had not forgiven them. I thought I did, because last year, Pastor Hans preached on this topic of forgiveness. And I said, okay, this is it. I need to do this. And I thought I did it. I really did. But clearly I didn't. They'd call, I'd ignore. They'd text, I'd text them back a week later. Didn't care. They wronged me, they hurt me. I feel this way for a reason. I can justify this. Look what they did to me. I was their responsibility, and they, I, did, I was holding them to this standard. Mad at them for not treating me the way God treats me. But they're not God. And so I did it. I'm like, I have to do this. I prayed on it, and then I FaceTimed them both, and I told you, Forgiving someone frees us. That was the most liberating thing I have ever done other than giving my life to Jesus. And I say that to say this, you can experience that too.